Good morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome. I'm just kind of testing. It's good to see everybody. I want to say thank you to Ingrid Johnson for praying for the weather every week. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Uh, Another glorious and beautiful day. But uh, yeah, we're glad you're here. Um, glad we can be outdoors together. And just again, everybody, I, everybody's doing well. But you know, if we get close to somebody, we should be masked. And when you're seated, that's fine. Some people are family members, or they're people that hang together a lot, and so they maybe just just have to use wisdom, basically. So that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> um, <coughs> So yeah, welcome. It's July uh, 4th weekend, and we are truly blessed to live in this great nation, uh, to be uh, partakers of the freedom uh, that that we have in this nation, and the prosperity and the peace that um, we probably take for granted, actually. (laughs) Uh, And I'm thinking of my, uh, our friend Victoria, who's in Lebanon this week. Um, this week. She's been there for, she's going on six months now. Uh, I talked to her this week, though. And, uh, you know, just such turmoil there, and there's just some very serious issues. There's no, the banking system is collapsing. There's there's numerous issues. So we really need to pray uh, for Victoria and the mission there. They have a lot of opportunity uh, to minister. Um, but it's it's kind of a tenuous time. I talked with her, and she sees it as an opportunity, but it's also there's a lot of unrest uh, there. <coughs> they are opening up again now, so they can uh, – the airports are open there, et cetera. But uh, along those lines, I talked with her uh, – the mission leader, uh, Johnny Lee, who's from China, who spent many years in the underground church in China <coughs> – and I told him that we were, he was here last fall, and I said, well, we're worshiping outdoors uh, this summer. And he said, oh, well, when we were, when there was great revival about 25 or so years ago in China, he said, we worshiped in the bushes. He said, we don't have trees like you had, but we called it wilderness worship. <laughs> and I said, well, look at that. There, there's nothing new under the sun, right? <laughs> wilderness worship. But then get this. This is what he said. He said, and it was great. It was a time of great revival. And he said, I remember going it early in the morning, just when the sun came up and we would all kneel in the snow and pray for two hours. (laughs) He he said it was a revival. (laughs) But I think it's looking better for this winter. I feel a little better about our options. (laughs) I'm starting to prime you for that now. But but no, the moral of the story is we're blessed, right? Uh. God is so good to us. God has been so good. The God is faithful to the church. Uh, <coughs> Johnny Lee just has a great heart for the kingdom of God, and that's why that ministry is happening in uh, Lebanon. So, so yes, thank you, God, for this nation. Thank you for the freedom and the liberties that we have here, and uh, praying that God will continue to transform us as a church and as a nation through the church. We're not perfect. We need God's grace. We always need God's grace. But God has blessed us abundantly, and so I'm thankful for that. (coughs) Okay. So what I wanted to do now, we have a testimony from Mr. Hunter. Hunter Hain is going to come and share a little, just a little testimony about a blessing of in his life from God. So come on right up, bud. So two weeks ago during uh, church, God God told me um, why he why he put us in the house that we live in now. Uh, he put us there because he knew coronavirus was coming, and um, 
it's a fun house. We can have lots of fun there. So he put us in that house instead of staying in Tupper. And we're closer to church. God spoke to him in church. Can you imagine that? <laughs> That's great. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, God, for knowing the beginning from the end. There's nothing that surprises him. There are no walls that uh, keep us uh, separated from him. And uh, by his Holy Spirit, we have uh, freedom, a new life. And I encourage you to worship him this morning in this beautiful setting and with these beautiful people. Hallelujah. Let me see your, uh, your, your, your little hymnals that you've got. Did you all get them? All right. Great. Okay. So we're going to sing through the first three songs. And we're going to not only sing them, we're going to worship the, our living God with those songs. And uh, you are welcome to stand with us. You're welcome to sit. You're welcome to clap. Um, but we would love that you uh, that you lift your hearts up in worship now with us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. We praise you, God. There were walls. There were walls between us. But by the cross you came and broke them down broke them down. There were chains around us, but by your grace they are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is great.
Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild, and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. Where the Spirit is here, let there be freedom. Lord, we celebrate freedom in you. Bring all of your burdens, bring all of your scars. Come back to communion, back to the stars. Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of his love Oh, the Spirit is here, let there be freedom, let there be freedom. Chains will fall, prisons shake at the sound of Jesus' name, lives made whole. Hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall, prisons shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. Where the Spirit is here, let there be freedom, let there be freedom. Let there be freedom. you, Lord. alone who took on flesh 
flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith. This gift of love, this righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Hell and every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Sing verse one. In Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when tears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. Thank you for peace. Thank you that your love is stable and sure. Lord, I pray this morning as we gather here, the Holy Spirit would touch lives that need peace, that need the assurance of your love, the assurance, the steadfastness of your mercy. Lord, we all need that. <laughs> so we ask for that this morning. We pray, Holy Spirit, come with your empowerment, empowering strength touch your people bring faith let faith arise we stand on the rock the cornerstone of christ the one who's risen the one who rose again victorious over death and sin 
Jesus, be our strength this morning. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord Jesus. You spoke the earth into existence, but you speak to each of us personally. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you. We profess our need for you daily. As we worship, we worship as your people together that have uniquely been brought together through the power of your Holy Spirit, through faith in you. We thank you for the church of God. We thank you for the family of God. We thank you that we can gather here today. And God, we believe as we do gather that you're strengthening us. You're pouring something into us, Lord. You're pouring something into your church that we would carry it to the hills, to the valleys, to the rivers, to the cities. And we thank you for the privilege, Lord, of serving you and living for you in this age, in this time, Lord. Let our hearts be full of worship. Let our hearts be turned towards you. Let our lives be laid down that your name would be lifted up, Lord. I pray, strengthen your church for the work that's ahead. Individually, Lord, we just surrender our hearts to you, fresh and anew. We say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Have your way, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Part of when we gather <coughs> is who we are together. And it occurred to me last week, you know, we, we, we were advised, you know, the distance. and But we also have to remember to connect <laughs> somehow, even if it's just with your eyes, right? <laughs> you know, we're, we try to be, and of course, any church should be a welcoming church and there should be good fellowship. But so I'm just saying that I don't know what it means, but make sure you connect. Make sure the gift of Christ in you encourages someone else in the body of Christ when we gather. Uh, it's so important that we do that. Uh, sorry, I'll quit playing with the mic. Um, <laughs> praise God. It's good to see everybody. You, you can be seated. I um, want to say thanks. So Chris Blue is going to share the message in just a, in a moment. Um, so that's great. Yay, Chris. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we'll set you up for that, but. Uh, so we're excited about that. But yesterday also, uh, Chris and Hannah and Marcy and Heather and Georgia and Sarah, I may have missed somebody, a few others came to be for support staff. Did I say everybody? Anyways, we did it. they did a little Americana concert back, uh, back behind Will Rogers. Uh, it was wonderful. A lot of folks came out on the deck. Um, it was just a blessing for me, and they, you know, they chimed in, sang along with them, and I told them over there that we pray for them, and we do. We pray for that building and the residents there uh, on a regular basis, but I just wanted to tell you all <laughs> to keep praying for our neighbors over here. That it's really important. It's an important place for outreach. It was so wonderful to see uh, them singing along with some of the songs that we, uh, that I didn't Chris and Hannah, etc., uh, sang. So just a reminder, pray for your neighbors. Amen? Um, <coughs> we don't take up an offering, but there's an offering uh, basket there, and there's one up there. Uh, so uh, you're welcome to give as the Lord puts on your heart. And I think that's all I need to share. I'm going to invite Chris to come. morning. Happy to be here, uh, excited to share, a little nervous to share, so bear with me. Um, but I was going to start with a funny introduction about with the service being live streamed. I was going to like wave hi to my mom watching on the internet, but then they showed up unexpectedly. Um, 
So now the pressure is on. So here we go. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to share about today is belief in something and conviction in something and then the actions that go along with the belief that if we really, really are convicted of a cause, then there will be things we do in support of the cause. And I'm not talking about works to be saved, and I'll clarify that shortly, um, but just conviction, belief, and action. Uh, and it being Independence Day weekend, I wanted to use an example from the Revolutionary War of someone who was convicted of their cause and took the action that needed to be taken to further it. Um, so in 1775, the British Army was in control of the city of Boston. The Americans had the city surrounded, under siege. The British couldn't get out, but the Americans couldn't get into the city. And that's a problem because not only is it a major morale blow that Boston's a major city under British control, but it's also the major port of the area. And in the day when goods are moved by sea, if you don't control the port, then you don't have access to the goods coming in or going out. So that's one problem. The other problem is that with Boston being a port, the British Army is in there, and the British Army is free to move troops into the city, move troops out of the city, redeploy their troops kind of anywhere along the seaboard. Um, so these are major problems for George Washington, because he can't, there's a bee in my hair, um, <laughs> he can't get in and retake the city. And the reason he can't do that is because he has men, but he doesn't have artillery. He doesn't have the heavy cannons that are required to bombard the British and force them out of the city to retake it. Um, but that's not to say that the Americans don't have any cannons at all. The Americans do have cannons, but not in Boston. Does anybody happen to know, except probably for my wife and my mom, <laughs> where the Americans might have 59 cannons? I see Cindy, go for it. Fort Ticonderoga in the Southern Ad Yeah, let's hear for the Adirondacks. Um, <laughs> Earlier in 1775, Ethan Allen, the Green Mountain Boys, uh, Benedict Arnold have captured Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point, and in those locations there's 59 cannon that the Americans could use to drive the British out. Um, the problem is Fort Ticonderoga is 300 miles from Boston, and again, what is standing in between Fort Ticonderoga and Boston? Again, the Adirondack Mountains, this, it's all peaks, it's all rivers, it's all lakes, and then you get out of the Adirondacks and you get into the Berkshire Mountains, which is the same thing. Um, so it's not as simple as putting the cannons on a truck on 87 and driving them down there, because there are really no roads to get to Boston. Um, so to get the cannons from Ticonderoga to Boston is a seemingly almost impossible undertaking. But there is a man who says he can do it. And his name is Henry Knox. Um, if you've heard of him, he was a bookseller in Boston before the war. He was by no means a career soldier up to that point, but he was a patriot and he was a man who was convicted in his cause and he knew those cannons needed to be moved. So he tor told George Washington, I will go get the cannons. So he goes to Fort Ticonderoga with a crew of men and with oxen. Oh, and did I mention it's winter at the time as well? <laughs> so like, w we don't like to drive long distance in the Adirondacks because it's cold and snowy. And they're about to haul 59 cannons, which weigh 120,000 pounds. So 120,000 pounds of just iron through the mountains in the wintertime. It's a task that I can't even imagine doing. Um, but they start out. They load the cannons onto barges. They float them down Lake George right before it freezes. Then they have to wait for it to snow to put them on sleds. And they push them through these frozen Adirondack miles. 300 up and down, no roads. Cannons fall into the water. Henry Knox pulls the cannons out of the water. But they continue in their cause. And six weeks after he left, which is three weeks, or no, it's three times as long as he said it would take him with the cannons, Henry Knox arrives in Boston with 59 cannons. And George Washington uses the cannons to drive the British from the city. So the question is why? What drove Henry Knox to do this task that seems impossible, or it seems extremely gif difficult? And I believe the answer was Henry Knox believed in his cause. He was convicted of his cause, 
And because he, was belie- be- be- he believed and he was convicted, he then took that action that he knew he needed to take to advance the cause. So what does that mean for us here? Well, we are a church, and a church is on a mission, is it not? A church has a cause. A church has the cause of advancing the kingdom of God. That's, that's why we're here. And so if we have a mission and a cause and we're convicted of it, I believe there's things we should be doing to further the cause. And I have three of them. I'm sure there's more, but these are the three big ones that jumped out to me that I'll share. Um, before, I'm just going to give a couple disclaimers just so there's no confusion. Again, when I talk about doing things, this is you know what we need to do. This is what we should be doing. I'm in no means talking about doing works to achieve salvation. That's a separate issue. That's a free gift. We could never do enough to earn that. Um, I'll get more into that later, but nothing means, we're not, not, not works to salvation. We're not talk, talking about that. Um, and the other thing I'm not doing is trying to like wave a finger at churches around and saying, you're doing this wrong and you need to, <coughs> you know, you're, you're, you're just wrong. You're doing it wrong. What I'm trying just to do is share some biblical truths that I've found that I think are the actions that naturally follow our belief and our conviction in our cause. So with that being said, um, the first action that I believe is critical for the church that the Bible teaches is to love the brethren, Christians loving other Christians. Um, and I'm going to read a couple verses. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll touch it. I'll risk taking somebody's stand. Sorry, Marcy, if you want it. Um, so, action number one, love the brethren. And if you have your Bible, I'm going to go be in 1 John for a couple of passages here. Um, so we'll start in 1 John chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 8 and go through verse 11. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion for stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, knowing not whether he goes, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Still in 1 John, we'll flip over to chapter 4. Oh, there they go. So chapter 4. Um, we'll read verse 10 through 12. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we, all, we ought also to love one another. And then the final passage, still in First John chapter 4, we'll s- read verse 20, and I guess this is verse 20. If a man say, I love God, and he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? So why do Christians love each other? Why do we need to love each other? Because I believe it demonstrates a fundamental understanding of God, of Christ, and what's he, what he has done for us. If we really believe that Jesus died for us, that God loved us enough even though we weren't perfect and even though we make mistakes, he sent his son to die for us because he loved us so much, we should be emulating that. And that should lead us to love those around us. And also, like the verse says, if we, can't, if we can't love the people that we have seen sitting right in front of us, how can we say we then love an invisible God who we haven't seen? Um, so it's just it's fundamental, I believe, and to our witness. Um, the world looks at the church. They need to see a church that loves each other. And that can be increasingly difficult, especially in today's culture, because every single week, as a culture, as a country, we're given a new reason to be divided and to be angry at each other. And you can pick any number of examples in the past, oh, four months that are just fraught with disagreement that can work their way into church. And I know Bruce has talked about this, so I apologize for going over um, the same ground again. But I'm obviously not that sorry because I'm about to do it. Um, (laughs) But uh, there's many things in the culture that can get into the church that will cause disagreement. And even further than that, disagreement and different viewpoints are inherent in the church because when Jesus came and died, 
he died for all men, no matter what they believe politically, where they're from, who they are. Jesus died for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. So then by default, everyone will come. And everyone includes people that maybe don't vote for the same president that you vote for. Um, maybe support social causes you don't. Maybe some people like to wear a mask in the store. Some people don't like to wear a mask in the store. Everybody comes because everybody has been called. So now the question is how? If we know we're supposed to love each other, how do we love each other? Because it's not always difficult, or it's not always easy, especially when people disagree. Um, and I believe the answer is in understanding what Christ did for us and understanding that we are Christians first before we are, we'll say Democrats, Republicans, whatever. We are called to follow Christ and we're called to do that before any number of causes that we also assign our value to. Um, and even in the Bible, they didn't always get along. Paul and Barnabas, I mean, loving doesn't mean you always get along and agree perfectly. Paul and Barnabas had a pretty significant argument, and the Bible says they parted ways. Paul went one way, Barnabas went the other way. That didn't lead them to hate each other. They was still love, but it was a disagreement. So we will, for, we will find disagreements, we will run across them, but if we realize that like Henry Knox, Henry Knox was in, was in a war, and the church is also in a war against the devil, against principalities and powers of the air. Um, and if we're all in a war together, then really we are all on the same side, uh, and that should lead us to act as if we are on the same side. If you're in a foxhole together, I imagine it suddenly doesn't matter quite so much exactly what the other guy believes. Um, so a biblical example of this, of two people who believed completely different causes, Jesus called them both, um, goes all the way back to who Jesus chose as his disciples. When Jesus was choosing disciples, he chose a lot of fishermen, kind of middle of the road guys, uh, and then he went to Matthew, and he said, come follow me, and Matthew was a tax collector who was part of the Roman system. Rome occupied Israel at the time and as such controlled it and the citizens had to pay the taxes to Rome and it was Matthew's job to go get those taxes. He's part of the Roman column. And Jesus says, come follow me. And then there's another man that Jesus calls and his name is Simon. Not Simon Peter, but Simon Simon. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Simon is a zealot. The Bible says Simon the zealot. And a zealot is, was a group of Jews that was militantly anti-Roman. They believed Rome should not be in Israel. They wanted to drive them out. They were willing to resort to violence and to killing to do it. So you could not find two guys that were like more opposite. If they met in the street, they would by no means be friends because in worldly issues, they absolutely disagreed. But Jesus looked at Matthew and he said, follow me. And he looked at Simon and he said, follow me. And both of them followed Christ first. And maybe they got along great. Maybe they disagreed. I, the Bible doesn't really say. But they both realized that they were called by Christ. And when Christ called them, they dropped what they had previously thought to be just so, so important. And they followed Christ. So if we believe that the church is on a mission, that the church is here to reach the lost, then let's follow Christ first. Even if we don't always agree with the exact same thing outside of here, what we do believe should draw us to love each other. So, point number one, love the brethren. Uh, point number two, the church needs to be different and set apart from the world. If we're here to reach the world with Christ, there is something different about us. And we'll start off with some scriptures about that. We will go to the book of John. Um, so starting in chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, if you want to read along. So Jesus is talking about the relationship of believers to the world. And Jesus says, if the world hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. 
Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will, kept, they will keep yours also. If we flip over in John to chapter 17, again, where Bruce has been preaching out of, um, we will read verses, so chapter 17, verse 14 through 19. As soon as I can find it. Okay, so Jesus is praying for his followers. He says, I, has gi- I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of this world, but thou should keep them from evil. For they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through truth. Thy word is truth. So in both of these passages, Jesus is saying, we are different than the world. Jesus, as Jesus was not of the world, the church is not of the world. And the values we hold and the things we believe to be true will fundamentally be different than the world. Because the world, by default, believes, is go- believe the world is going this way in their belief. And Jesus came, and Jesus is going that way. Because the world can adopt an attitude of, it's all good, whatever, you do you, headed that way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, headed that way. So what makes us different from the world is that we believe in the Bible and what the Bible says. And yes, we absolutely love the world. We absolutely love those in it. We absolutely reach them with the love of Christ. But bottom line is we won't agree on a lot of issues because we have a completely different set of rules, a completely different set of belief from the world given by Christ for us to follow. And as Jesus says, the natural consequence of this is people don't really like it sometimes. The Bible says they have, uh, because they hated me, they hate you. And that's not to say that every time you walk out your door, people are going to be like throwing tomatoes at you or anything like that. But inherently, if you go against what the world says, there is going to be tension because what Jesus is saying, what the Bible is saying, is the world is wrong. And that's not a message anybody really likes to hear. (laughs) But Jesus is calling us this way because he is the way, the truth, and the life. The world goes this way. And as a church, if we believe we need to reach people, we follow the way that Christ says. Because you can't bring people out of the world into the same thing. And again, going back to our witness, if the world looks into a church and they say, they're really not that different from any of us, they really don't love each other that much, what does that say for our witness, for our belief? So the church needs to love each other, Christians need to love Christians, and we are different from the world, even if it means it's going to upset people and the world is not going to like it. But we are called to follow Christ and follow the Bible no matter what. So, point number one, love the brethren. Point number two, be set apart from the world. Point number three, which I believe is a culmination of points one and two, it's why we do the first two things, is share the gospel spread the word, grow the kingdom of God. And to do that effectively, yep, we need to love each other and we need to follow the Bible, believe the Bible's word and be set apart from the world. And when we do those things, our witness to the world is effective. Um, So, and we all share the gospel and we all share the gospel differently. And I'm not gonna stand up and say, everybody needs to go out in the street and you all need to start street preaching because that's the way to share the gospel or You all need to have one-on-one conversations because that's the way to share the gospel. Because God will call everyone to share the gospel differently. God will use everybody's different strengths and weaknesses. And so how you do that, I recommend asking God about that instead of me. Um, But So it's a personal thing, how you do it. But we all need to share the same gospel and the whole gospel. And... Some parts of the gospel are easier to share than other parts of the gospel. Um, Because the part about the gospel that where where Jesus loves, like the the unfailing love of God, God loves everybody, that's absolutely true. God came for everybody, absolutely true. 
God can love you no matter what, regardless of what you do. Absolutely true. All those things are true. But to only, to leave off there is not, a f- it's an incomplete gospel. It's not that those things aren't true because they are. But that's kind of, I, s- I see that as part two of the gospel. Um, where after you come to Christ. But the reality is there's a first part of the gospel that is not as enjoyable to share, frankly, um, because it involves, going back to what we said before, saying people are wrong and saying the world is wrong. Um, And so the full gospel, I believe, is this, that, yes, in the beginning, God created in the heaven and the earth. God is all-powerful, God is all righteous. God is perfect. Nothing that's not perfect can't be with God. And because God is righteous and perfect and holy, God is a righteous and perfect and holy judge. And whatever is not righteous and perfect and holy can't be with God and will be judged as fallen. And God has given a law to live by, that says this is how you need to live. He's given God has a set of rules and expectation for perfection. And every single person has broken those expectations. And so every single person is guilty of not being perfect. And the penalty for being guilty of not being perfect before God is death and hell. And then on top of that, because that's a scary message to hear, so we say, what can I do? I don't want that. What can I do? I I must be able to do something so that doesn't happen. And the reality is you can't do, you personally can't work your way back. You can't do something to be good enough because the standard of perfection is perfect. And we've already all blown it. Um, In the song we sing, it says, there were walls between us. And there was. And it was a wall that was impossible for us to climb. So the bottom line is, Everybody has wronged God. Everybody has sinned. Everybody is guilty. Nobody can work their way back, and the penalty is death and hell. And I hope nobody left because that's the first part of the gospel, (laughs) which makes the second part of the gospel even more glorious and even more unbelievable. And that is God looked at an entire race of people, all of which had turned away and done their own thing and wronged him and failed his standard of perfection. And he looked at them and said, I want those people back. Because God is all loving. And because God is love, he has a perfect love. And he said, even though they've all messed up, I love those people, I want those people back. And he loved us so much that he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, down to earth to live the perfect life that nobody on earth could live. But going back to God being a perfect judge, because he's a perfect judge, he still requires the payment, the penalty for that sin, which is death. And he sent Jesus down to take that payment that everybody owed him. Jesus lived the perfect life, and Jesus died the death that everybody else deserved. So that we didn't have to. So that God, the perfect judge, his standard of perfection is now satisfied in what Christ did for us on the cross because God loves us. And furthermore, because again, we say, I want that. What do I have to do? There's got to be something I can do to get that. And that's what the rich young ruler said when he came to Christ on the road. He said, what can I do to be saved? And he really wanted it. So people really want to be saved. So how? And the bottom line is we couldn't earn it before, and we can't earn it now. All we can do is accept it. Accept that Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he did. That he is the perfection of God, that he is perfect, that he did die for us, that he did rise again. We accept that. And then we repent. And repentance sometimes gets this vibe that it's like you got to say sorry for your sins every time and then you have to try really hard to not do them again and you have to try 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 um but repenting is turning from the world turning from whatever you were doing and turning to god it's not 
oh man, I have to try even harder. I sinned again. I must not be trying hard enough because we can't try because it's impossible. But repentance is saying, I was going this way. I was going the way of the world. And then I met Christ and I believed. And now I've turned from the way I was going and turned to Christ. So it's a turning from one thing to another. And it's free. And you can't earn it. And frankly, you shouldn't try. Um, because it's impossible. And the Bible says, don't do that. Just take the grace. You've been giving grace. And once you have turned to Christ, then you're perfect. And your perfection, God sees, is the perfection of Christ. Because that is the standard you will. On the day when everybody faces judgment, if you have believed Christ, repented, turned to Christ, when God looks at you and says, let's see what this guy has done, let's see what his judgment is going to be, he will see the life of Christ and the perfection of Christ. Because we all had our list. An example, we all have like a list of all the things we've ever done, and God's got it like somewhere in heaven. Um, so all of our sins, all the things we've ever done to, to wrong him are on a list. Jesus also has a list. And Jesus' list says, perfect, lived 33 years, died under the reign of Pontius Pilate, fulfilled the whole law, guilty in nothing, righteous before God. And when we repent, your list of the things you've done is taken out of, say, you have a folder. It's taken out of your folder, and it's put in the folder of Jesus because he died on the cross for you. And Jesus' perfect list is taken and put in your folder. And when God pulls that folder out, on the last day, he will see the perfection of Christ in you. And that, I believe, is the full gospel. And you can't really have part two without part one. And part one makes part two infinitely more valuable and infinitely more glorious and infinitely more beautiful because it is the whole truth. Um, so we love the brothers, love the Christians. We're different from the world and we spread the gospel, all of it. So if we really believe it, if we believe in our cause that we're here to advance the kingdom of God, let's do those things. Um, and I'll just give one final example, going a little long. Um, but let's say Henry Knox in a different world, Henry says, yeah, I believe in the revolution, I believe we should be a free country, blah, blah, blah. And George Washington says, go get the, hen the, the cannons. And Henry Knox says, okay, and he goes, and he comes back with no cannons. And George Washington says, Henry, where are the cannons? You said you believed. Where are the cannons? But if Henry came back with no cannons, how strong was Henry Knox's conviction? So if we believe it, if we really believe it, then let's do it. Bruce, I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> Wow, that's great. <laughs> uh, you know, I always, I always, if we can have the worship team come. The gospel is so rich. And it doesn't take much living in this world to see the need. That's what Chris, the first part of the gospel is the need. Fallen mankind. Nobody is, has escaped that, but... Uh, I really want that to that should percolate in our spirits and I kind of where I always go when I think when we see that how significant the need is and how wonderful the redemption is you know he he who has been forgiven much loveth much <laughs> but if we don't see how desperate our situation is that love which creates the conviction to live for Christ uh doesn't take full power I don't believe um so let that love of God uh, touch your hearts and lives in thankfulness for his great forgiveness. And then let that be a motivator. I, I appreciate it, Chris. So we're going to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. I steal my son's mic again. But um, the last verse says, Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Woo, he's faithful. Pardon for sin 
and peace that endures. If that's not something that's a reality, find it. Find out how to turn your life over, to give Christ the reign and ask for forgiveness. Uh, peace that endures is wonderful in our hearts and our lives. So let's sing together. Mm-hmm. Following the song, uh, we do want to pray. If anybody would like prayer, come up right in front of the stage here, this area, if you'd like prayer. We'll have folks here to pray with you. Um, if those are going to break down, just give us a few moments if there's folks here to pray. Uh, but really let those words sink into your life and your heart. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto verse or that chorus one more time and we're uh, we're going to step away from the mics and the instruments and just sing it together as a congregation